Hi everyone. Um, I've spoken many times at Elixir Sydney, um, usually about drones and avionics and all of that sort of stuff, but today I'm not uh, doing that. Um, this is basically just a, a lightning talk that got out of control um, and veered into sort of like chain lightning, ball lightning, some sort of extra, probably, I probably was responsible for that um, resistor. Sorry about that, Ryan. Um, so yeah, so this is basically just the ISBN verif Verify Elixir um, 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 exorcism in Elixir, but I'm also going to look at some other lang um, 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 some other languages, etc. Um, so yeah, getting on with this. Oh, where is my clicky thing? Okay, so ISBN International Standard Book Number. Um, it's basically a it's a, a ten-digit number, and the last digit is a check digit. And the idea is that when you scan a book at a um, on a checkout or whatever, that you can detect when there's been a typing error. So it's an error correcting code. It can detect that there's been an error. It, it can't. Oh, sorry, no. It's an error detecting code. It can tell that there's been an error, but it can't fix the error. There are some codes, um, like the ones you use on a DVD or CDs and things like that, which can actually repair. Um, you know. Uh, some numbers if they're wrong, but this one, all it can do is if that check digit, basically what you do is you do this sum where here are all of your numbers, you ignore all, you take out all the dashes, you ignore those, but only the last digit can be an X and that means 10 because it's possible that the check digit could be a 10 and we don't want to write two digits for that, we just want to write an X. Um, and the idea is that you multiply the first one by 10, the first, the second digit by 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 4 3, 2, 1, so on. Um, you add those together and the when you add the check digit onto it, if you um, then you should be an exact multiple of 11. That is to say that, um, so in this case, 264 is 24 times 11 plus zero. And because you only, you have to have, because you add zero to it, that means it's an exact multiple and that means it's a valid ISBN number. Okay. Um, so I'm going to use those colors. The reason I put colors, the purple and the orange there for later on is so that you can recognize um, those values in some of the code samples coming up. So um, when I refer to the purple numbers are going to be coefficients that we're multiplying the digits by and the orange, orange numbers are going to be a running sum of, uh, the, of uh, you know, the totals. When we multiply the digits by the coefficient, the sum is going to be in orange. Okay, so I just did actually after I did this um, answer, I just I thought it was it made more sense to put this at this point in the um, in the uh, presentation. I did a bit of a survey of the first page of um, exorcism answers for this question in Elixir, and um, so I thought I just do yeah just did 20, looked at twenty one different solutions just to give you an idea of how people are solving this. The lines of code, all including the comment at the top went between 27 and 117 with an average of 46. There were functions, that is differently named functions, like uh, I counted one function with multiple arities or multiple heads as a single function. So there were between one and seven functions with an average of three. 86% um, of the answers used high order functions, like plenty of map, maps and folds and these sorts of things. 67% used multi-clause functions. I just decided that when you have or multi-headed function, I just started calling it multi-clause when I was writing this. And the more I wrote it, the more confused I got about whether or not that's actually what I meant. I just mean um, the same function with, um, you know, with uh, multiple heads, multiple clauses. Um, only 43% used reg regular expressions, but I think that was actually because people, I think, correctly worked out that regex was a bit of overkill for this problem. Um, so I wouldn't say that's because people don't know about regular expressions. And, um, but then <clears throat> I've done a lot with binary patterns because of the, some of the drone stuff that I've been doing with um, all of the messages and bits and pieces that I'm, I'm parsing. Um, and so I was surprised to see that only 19% of them were using binary patterns, especially since it was simple string manipulation and in Elixir, unlike Erlang, strings are actually binaries. Um, and the other thing was that I learned lots um, from looking at those. Um, there were, um, you know, there were, I gave, I gave out four stars and I should just say that a part of using exorcism is we should go and look at the answers and we should hand out stars to answers that are good because without the stars being handed out, all of the, um, answers are equally 
there's no a new developer coming to Elixir doesn't get any idea what's idiomatic or what's considered good or what's considered not you know not good. Um, and so I think it's important if you do an exorcism to definitely fill you know go go around and look at least at the first page and hand out some stars for things where you learn stuff. I actually learned I, I was reminded of a few things. I, one thing is I was reminded that you could actually do filters on um, comp, binary comprehensions, which is something I haven't done. And so that was quite cool. And another person reminded me that um, you could actually, with with binary pattern matching, you could actually, because ISBNs are a fixed length, you could actually just do a huge single pattern match. And um, combining those two things, after the fact, I did this. This is my runner-up solution for this for this um, for this one. Um, and this is the runner-up. It only it only gets twenty four of the twenty five tests passing. There's one test it can't it doesn't pass, but um, just on that 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 first line, the case line, that's this. Um, what that does is all that's really doing is chopping out the minus signs from the original string, um, and it's got a and the format there. In case you're not familiar with that, is it's uh, the first bit is um, the binary comprehension. The after the second comma is a filter expression, which is basically making sure that's that we're only looking at um, valid digits or, or X's question mark. Um, that's something I'd forgotten earlier on was that question mark was a, a shortcut for saying the ASCII value of the following character. So that was nice and short. Um, and then um, all we do is we can, so we can convert that, um, that uh, C minus question mark is a way, a way to quickly convert the, the, the digit four into the value four. Then we do, then you can do a, um, then you can just basically do a great big um, pattern match on all the digits. You can, and then you can do the whole remainder expression. So we're just basically, we, this is exactly like, like all good functional programming programs, the code often looks like the answer. And if you cast your mind back to that previous slide, this looks almost exactly like the formula that I'd written up um, before. Um, or I do a little hack to make sure that if, um, if uh, it was an X, I, I turn an X into a 10. Um, and uh, then I calculate the thing. And if it didn't match that pattern, then it's um, it's going to be a false answer anyway because it wasn't a valid ISBN. Okay, but um, part of the reason this doesn't work is um, that if you there's one check where if the ISBN is actually longer than it's supposed to be, the problem is that that um, comprehension up on the second line um, destroys information about the what what the original string looked like. And really that's sort of like a, that's like we're doing all of our pass through the string up in that comprehension. And then we do this big check at the end. And what we need to do is we need to have our fingers more in the inside of that comprehension. We need a bit more flexibility on that second line to be able to do some more checks. And so, um, well, that's my segue to the, my actual answer, which we're gonna, I'm gonna take you through here, which is um, looking at a single pass through the string um, doing everything we need to do to validate the ISBN in one pass of the string and to do it recursively. And I would say that um, looking at the other answers here, at least, I mean, I know there's a lot of experienced Elixir developers um, uh, here in the meeting, but um, a lot of people go, I think a lot of people go straight to the um, high order functions um, when sometimes um, just doing a recursive answer is, um, is, is, um, would actually be almost more straightforward. And I remember how weird thinking recursively was when I first started doing it and how you sort of thought that, you know, working out how to do a traditional for loop in, a, in another language um, was, you know, very easy and doing, doing a recursive solution was hard. But I've found since that really, they're both very similar and, they're, and you know, they're both, they're both things that you can uh, learn um, that you know that one's not a witchcraft and the other's not easy. They're, they're both things that you can just pick up a knack for for doing and, and internalize and make it as easy as thinking about traditional loops. So I thought we'd learn more if we um, actually did a just like a looked at a recursive answer in a little bit in a little bit of detail. Because um, my um, my other solution is shorter than this solution, so we'll go in and have a look. Um, so the first thing we'll do is um, 
we'll just think about how, if it's, it's a recursive solution, let, let's just think about how we want the function signatures to look as we recurse through the string. Um, so the first thing that we want to do is we need to carry all of our state along with us from, from one recursion to the next. So though that, um, so that um, the coefficient that we want to multiply numbers by, the purple 10, and the sum of um, the sum of the sum to date zero, we want to just add those into our um, add those into the initial call that our user that our user did. Um, then, so that's the first sort of expansion that we want to do from just from the argument to adding the two extra variables to the argument. Number two, and I'm just keep in mind this one, two, three, four, and five, um, because I'm going to refer back to them as we go backwards and forwards between different languages because um, we're going to treat it clause by clause. So here's the second one. This is the, the meatiest one where we do the actual calculation. And you can see basically that we, on the, on, we took 10 times the first digit, which is three, and, uh, we, and that is 30, and we added that to our sum, and we decreased our, um, and we decreased our uh, coefficient from 10 to nine, and we've chopped off the front character from our binary. Um, and then we just do the next one is um, is uh, transition number three is just basically getting rid of the minus sign, um, and you can see there that all we've done is we've chopped the first character off the ISBN binary, and we left nine and thirty the way they were because a minus sign doesn't have any effect on the answer. Then we do some more twos, um, which are doing the calculation again, um, adding nine times eight and then seven times eight onto the total. Um, more of the same. All that's happening is we're just doing more combinations of those of of uh, step two and step three to chew up um, through the rest of the string, getting rid of the minus signs and adding onto our totals as we go and decrementing our coefficient. And finally, we get down to the point um, where um, we get an x. Now, an x can only appear in the last spot, so you know it's only x one that um that should work for this we, we can't have x2 or x3 because x only x the check digit only works in the last spot um and so all we do is whenever you encounter an x it's always in the last position it's always times one so that an x is worth 10 so it just basically means you add 10 onto your sum and you get rid of and you replace it with an empty an empty binary because you know, you've finished uh, chewing your way through a valid isbn at this point and um, at this point, we've got our total, which is 264. So all we have to do here is step five, which is um, take the remainder of, uh, take 264 modulo 11 and check to see that it's equal to zero. And if it's true, we have a valid ISDN number. Okay, so there's only five different steps that we need to, so, so far that, we, um, that uh, we need to do. So now we'll work backwards from 54321 and we'll just translate those into Elixir. Um, first of all, um, step five, um, we have an empty string, the multiplier is zero and we have a sum. Uh, so all we do is we, uh, we have an ISBN function that takes an empty binary, a zero and a sum and um, calculates the remainder of pretty much exactly word for word what, the, um, what we worked through just then. Um, and um, for people who are new to Elixir a bit, the angle brackets, that's the same as an empty string. Strings are binaries in Elixir. So when you have double, double less than, double greater than, that's, a, that's a basically an empty string, an empty, an empty binary. Um, on this one, um, it's uh, again, pretty similar here. All we do is if we see x1 and some sum, we replace it with the empty, an empty binary zero and the sum plus 10, like we said. Um, here, if there's a minus sign, um, so here again uh, in the in the Elixir code below, I just use question mark minus, which means the the minus sign character is at the start of the string, match you know the rest of the string. Um, this is I'm not sure how, how familiar people are with binaries, but this is just like chopping the head off a list. Okay, um, the rest is going to be the rest of the ISBN string. And all we do is we chop off the first character. Um, number two is where we do um, more stuff. Now, um, 
in um, binary matching, you can take care of graphemes and UTF-8 if you use that colon colon UTF-8 for matching the first character. It'll it'll um, combine if you've got multi-byte graphemes or whatever. It'll it'll take them all into um, into one chunk. Of course, in ISBN numbers, there aren't any um, there aren't any uh, really any UTF characters. It's all plain ASCII, but um, that was just to basically to show you that that's how you can handle um, UTF-8 in a binary pattern match. And all we do is we have a guard where we make sure that the character is a digit. And if that's the case, then we do our calculation, which is pass on the rest of the ISBN, um, decrement our, um, our coefficient by one, and do our sum where we add, um, add the character um, times the coefficient onto the sum so far. And the first one's really trivial. Uh, we uh, just basically call ourselves and add on the two initial arguments. And so if we put, well, actually there might be one more thing. And, and normally I'd go through this some um, really loving sort of, you know, interactive point with the audience here. But since we're online, I'll just say that um, rather than saying, um, you know, is that everything? No, it's not. Yes, it is. Whatever. We'll just say, well, yeah, there's one more thing we need to do, which is, the um, negative case, which is anything else happening to our ISBN number. If anything else happens, um, we return false. It's not a valid ISBN number. And that means that my Elixir solution uh, to ISBN verifier looks like this. And that's um, uh, 23 lines. Now, I could say, I mean, I'm actually because of some of the coding I've done recently with some big sort of code generated things for, um, for the, for the drone stuff I've been doing, I've become really used to, people might say, well, this is really more than more than a 23 line thing because I should be putting more of those things onto multiple lines. But I actually, just to be honest, I actually find this, I find this really pure in a nice way because this is the, this is everything that this program can do. There are six different things it can do. There's, there are the five things we went through plus the um, well, plus the false case. And each one of those is just one thing that we can do. Um, one thing we can do to, you know, at every point, there's your state. And this is what you do with that state. And I just find that really pleasing. You know, I don't, I don't think there's, you know, um, it's, uh, well, yeah, I will... Uh, yeah, and, um, and, just to, and just to show that um, if you look around at some of the other answers online to this one, um, like I said, very few people are using these binary patterns and they do make it really nice and straightforward and very clean. So that's that answer. And, but as promised, we're going to um, mix it up a little bit. Um, so Lisp flavored Erlang. Now in the past, I've, um, I have, uh, Actually, at uni, I had an aversion to Lisp. There was a, a Lisp assignment in third year, and my friend was a lecturer, and he begged me to do the assignment, and I just flatly refused to do it because there were so many brackets, and it sort of, and I, I don't know, maybe there was too much going on in my life, and I just found adding learning Lisp um, in third year uni as uh, was just like one step too far. But um, there's a lot of amazing things about Lisp, and um, I more recently, a few years ago, we went and did a closure course just to sort of like because. You know, Clojure is one of the modern, you know, very popular versions of Lisp. Um, and I just thought, surely someone's done a Lisp for Erlang because Lisp is one of those language projects that seems to turn up on every platform. And sure enough, it turned out that Robert Verding, the co-creator of um, Erlang with Joe Armstrong, had actually created a thing called Lisp Play with Erlang. Um, and so the nice thing here is if ever you've been curious about Clojure or Lisp, um, then then LFE is a way to sort of get some exposure to that without leaving the comfort of the beam. Um, and so if you're not uh, curious about this, then, then I think they were targeting the bottom half of this page at the non-curious people. Um, because uh, <laughs> at some, yeah, Lisp is a, very, is, a, what, is a very early, very early and very interesting programming language. Uh, and it's probably, I think it's one of those languages that everyone can really learn from, from having a look, because it is very um, incredibly small syntax, you know, capable of running on 1950s computers. You can't say that of many languages. Um, 
I don't know what the banana banana of languages means, except that maybe it's something to do with hot swap and being the fire or the Venus of your desire. Um, it's got all the nice things about the Erlang platform, um, and um, also Lisp is um, you know is a fantastic place to be if you're making up domain specific languages or or those sorts of things. So let's have a look. Um, clause by clause, remember our zero, one, two, three, four, five clauses. Let's just work through those and translate our uh, Elixir clauses into um, into LFE. First of all, start off with the simplest one, just to cover off a few basic things. Here's our um, here's our negative case of the ISBN checker. So, first of all, um, Lisp is um, everything in almost everything in Lisp is a list. Um, and uh, so, and the list is delimited by uh, round brackets. Uh, so, and this does mean that you do get a proliferation of a lot of brackets. And um, it used to be that people said that Lisp stood for lots of irritating special parentheses, which uh, I think is sort of, I think it is probably one of the things that strikes you when you're looking at it. Um, so, um, so everything, most things are lists. Um, by default, the first item in a list is considered to be a function and the remainder of the items in the list are the arguments to that function. So defun, define function, itself a function, a list function. It's um, the function, you, you see the bracket actually is in front. Defun is the first item in the list. The then we've got the name of the function we're defining, ISBN verify. And then there's going to be multiple clauses. Um, this is just like a multi-headed function where, and each, and in each, in each clause, there'll be a list. The first item will be the pattern or the arguments that you're matching, just like a, an Elixir function, Erlang function. And then the rest of it will be the, uh, the rest of it will be the value or, or, or whatever the, you know, the expression that, that, uh, that, uh, uh, yeah, the, the expression that you should that the function should return. Um, and in that case, by the way, I don't actually know. Um, there are probably some people who are very good at Lisp here, and I'm this. I, I just want to say I'm not. This is the, one of the first things I've written in Lisp since since uni. Um, so I could easily say something wrong, and so please correct me um, at the end. But um, I to make this work, I found I had to put a quote in front of false to make sure that false was considered as the literal value false and not further interpreted, which I don't quite understand why I needed to do that, but um, that just means literal false. Okay, so that we've got some of the basic things. So why did I call it ISBN underscore verify and not just ISBN? Um, well, because in um, LFE, uh, a function has to have the same arity. You can't have a different arity. So in Elixir, we had an arity one ISBN and an arity three ISBN, um, and, it, and, and in LFE we can't do that. So we've got ISBN um, arity one, and then I've got um, ISBN verify being my arity three, the one that takes the ISBN number, the coefficient, and the sum is uh, called ISBN underscore verify. So this is our clause one. Um, if you call, if you say ISBN and get pass an ISBN, it's going to call ISBN verify and pass through the ISBN the uh, the coefficient and the sum. Notice that there are no um, there's no commas. It's just white space delimited lists. Um, like when we say it's funny because when you actually try to look at a code highlighter or a syntax highlighter for Lisp, there's almost nothing to highlight because which is one of the really crazy things about Lisp is how little syntax there is. Um, okay, so that is there anything we need to do there. Um, I hope I'm, hopefully this something, um, so we've got defun, function name, arguments, and then the body of the function on the next line is what we're looking at. Um, this is our complex one. Um, so, for, and first of all, um, like Erlang, um, LFE uses character lists for strings. And so if we're, there is no LFE exorcism, but I thought that to be idiomatic with um, LFE, we should have a character list string, not a binary one. Um, so, uh, and I'm just going to put here, I'm 
this is, I'll show you in the code listing at the end, this is just one of the clauses and it's wrapped inside the defun ISBN verify along with all the other clauses, but this is just one clause. Um, the first line is a pattern, just like in, in Elixir. And cons is short from for construct a list. It's, um, it's basically saying it's, it's like that C rest binary. It's exactly the same thing. It's a pattern match where the first item in the list will be C and the rest of the list will be rest. Um, and then we've also going to be passed the coefficient N and the sum. The next line is our guard. So it's got when, just like uh, Elixir and Erlang, and it's got a prefix notation. Um, so if you're having problems with this and you're used to writing kernel dot something um, in a pipe in Elixir, then maybe that would help help to look at it like this. But we're basically saying exactly the same thing as, as what Elixir was saying. We have to have, oh, the other thing to point out is hash backslash zero is the same as question mark zero in Elixir. Okay, so we're, we're doing exactly the same comparison as the second line of the Elixir version. And then the last two lines are just uh, a wrapped version of that, of that uh, call to um, ISBN verify. So we're, is that right? Um, yes, that's right. We're going to call ISBN verify. Um, the first argument is the rest of the ISBN string. The next one is uh, coefficient minus one um, and then the rest of it's our sum where we add um, the sum to date with n times um, c minus the ASCII value for the digit zero and then there's a huge number of um, parentheses at the end which is you know gives um gives light oh you know which illustrates very much that lots of irritating special parentheses aspect of lisps Okay, this one, um, where this one's pretty trivial. Uh, we're just eating the minus sign from the front of the list. So cons hash backslash minus rest. So we're taking we're taking the string that starts with the minus sign and we're just gonna pass on the same string without the minus sign. Um, and then four, um, we are handling that case where we found the check digit and the check digit value is uh, X and all we're going to do is um, uh, uh, pass on the empty list zero and the sum so far plus 10. And the last one is the, um, in the very, the very final case where we've actually got the sum, we've got an empty list. There's nothing more to do except to um, check that if you take the, the sum remainder 11, that it is equal to zero. And in prefix notation, that last line is that last line does exactly that. So that winds up looking like this. We add a def module up the top. Notice that the module isn't like wrapping; it's not wrapping the rest of the code. It's just like a, a thing that you put up at the top of the file. There's a single arity ISPN um, that just calls the 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 three tuple the, the three argument ISPN verify. And there is just exactly all of the different um, uh, function heads or different versions that we had in the uh, Elixir version, which is here. So you can sort of see that the, um, you know, they're almost semantically identical. I mean, I've got a spec on the Elixir version, but you can almost read line for line the exact same thing um, in um, LFE and Elixir. And I added the syntax highlighting because um, I don't actually have a syntax highlighter that highlights LFE, but I thought it looked really unfair when LFE was just in gray and there was all this nice syntax highlighting on the Elixir. So I just put in some colors in the uh, LFE listing. Um, to I'm supposed honest. to highlight the stuff that isn't the parentheses. Well, see it had, I just tried to use the same colors yeah, I suppose that would be, yeah, yeah. No, I think it's like, wear it loud, wear it proud. If you're a Lisp, you want to make sure that everyone realizes just how many fantastic parentheses are there. I think that's the, that's the aim. Um, I'm open to suggestions for better coloring. Probably there's some Emacs users who are actually trying to find out my address so they can kill me at this point. But um, there's, um, it seems like if you're working in a Lisp, then, um, then uh, it's, uh, 
It's amazing because like um, IntelliJ does not have any, well, I mean, it's got closure, so I suppose it's got, but it doesn't have any sort of general list um, syntax highlighting. Um, one question oh, yeah. though. Yeah. Uh, you're missing the first clause from the Elixir version. Is that intentional? Oh, uh, no, that's the, we've got the, the first clause is that um, the I see the oh, first sorry. line is, the, you see it's, it's calling, because it's not separated out, because we can have multi arity ISBNs in the Elixir version. So that line under the spec is the same as the def, the first defun ISBN. And why have we got that? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six. No, that, that's right. The, the, the first ISBN question, the, the first ISBN under the spec in the Elixir version corresponds to the defun ISBN in the LFE version. And then the second line of um, the ISBN verifier in the Elixir version corresponds to the cons C rest version, the, the cons C rest um, function in the um, LFD version. Yeah, got it. I just didn't see the second line of the list. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, but I suppose, look, just the thing here to also to point out while we've got these two things side by side, the veil between the two languages is very thin. Um, so, you know, it, they really are very similar and, and even more so in, um, in macro programming in Elixir, the AST, the abstract syntax tree looks even more like Lisp because it's all, um, it's all this prefix notation stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, and so both of these things at the end of the day though, they're compiling down to very similar code for the bean, which is the, um, and by the way, I've put up, this is up on the, um, on, the Git, on the GitHub channel, all of the links, this whole presentation is up, up there. So if you want to study this a bit further, I can come back later in the presentation, but um, all of this will be available after the Prezo. You can, you can look at the Prezo yourself. Um, so they're all going to, um, they're all going to the assembly code to run on the beam, some, um, to run on the beam virtual machine. And the way you do that, um, if you're using Elixir, I know you might be, I mean, we all sort of atrophy using the actual Elixir command line compiler because we're so used to using Mix. But if you use the Elixir compiler um, and you set all export all compiler options equals, uh, and then you have a term with a capital S in it, a list with a capital S in it, then what that will do is it will actually produce a .s file, which is um, assembly code. Um, instead of producing um, if, instead of producing a beam file, it will produce the assembly code. And if you do that second line, if you've, if you've, if you've installed LFE, um, then if you use that line with the to assembler option, um, it will also produce um, assembly or beam assembler code um, from that. Um, so currently, um, yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll just put it aside. No, no, I'll, I'll leave it to later. I think I've said it in another in another slide. Um, so I'll um, I'll show you what that code looks like. Um, in this case, I'm just going to show you this one. Okay, so ISBN verifier.s. For people who know Erlang, they'll recognise that this is an Erlang term list, um, which is incredibly difficult to convert into Elixir. Um, you have to do that. You, basically, it's just a list of um, this is basically just a list of terms um, in, in Erlang or in, but to make an elixir, you just wrap it in a list. Um, you have to put colons in front of everything that's an atom and you replace the full stops with question with uh, commas. And that's basically what, you know, if you were writing this in elixir, that's how that would look. Um, um, and the really good, and the reason that I went here, I know it seems a bit sort of deep divey to sort of go here, but but because the ISBN verifier is such a, a small amount of code, um, it's actually good to look at this in assembler because um, tiny Elixir programs become a reasonable presentable side size in assemb in assembler. Um, but um, that's only part of the part of the problem because we have to understand what does all of this mean, um, like you know, how are we going to actually find out how to write or how to read this stuff? So that takes me to my next topic, which is the Beam book. So there's a guy called Eric Stenman, who back, I think, in 2014 was going to start an O'Reilly book all about the Beam. Um, and O'Reilly, it was working for a while. It sounds like it was quite difficult um, to, um, to um, write. And O'Reilly eventually stopped and he moved to Prag Pragmatic Publishers, 
um, and they stopped as well. So either it's a very difficult topic or um, I don't know, but um, but good. But um, thankfully, Eric decided to start sharing it with some students at, at his uni and um, and it started getting out. And so he and apparently the conditions around the, the books were such that he could turn it into an open source project. And so the Beam book, it's not finished, but it's got a few contributors and um, it's uh, they're basically trying to document the Beam and how it works. OK, so. The Beam virtual machine, it's just a logical description of a machine that's not dissimilar to a physical CPU, but designed perhaps to be nicer for developers to work with because you don't have the constraints of the actual resistors and circuits and stuff like that of the CPU to work with. You can just make a make something that is a nice target for people writing compilers. Um, Beam VM emulators are programs that are written like the one we, all, we are all using is in C, but there's another one written in in Java for Erljang, um, and they simulate the Beam VM. So in the same way that you've got a Piper Cherokee, oh damn, I mentioned an airplane. You've got a Piper Cherokee as the as there's that's the the logical design, and then you've got X Plane simulating a Cherokee. That's what your emulators are doing. They simulate this machine for you. Um, programs a list of instructions that the Beam that a process running in the Beam, like one of your processes, you know, when you go when you um, when you uh, start link and create a process, um, they're just running uh, lists of beam instructions. There's a few hundred instructions, mathematical operators, things for moving and copying values around, jumping around to labels, um, and sending and receiving messages and all the other good stuff that Erlang does. And, um, and basically each of those instructions is implemented as C code inside the emulator. Um, this is a bit of a rabbit hole for people who haven't sort of gone into, you know, thinking about, you know, virtual machines and assemblers and things before, but I'll just thought I'd lay out some of these basic things here. Um, in the book, they say that, that this assembly language we're about to look at is the target that if you're making a new language, if you're making a new compiler for the Beam, you're supposed to be targeting this language. But the only examples I know of, which are Elixir and LFE, they both go via Erlang. So Elixir and LFE, probably because they're quite like Erlang, they compile into Erlang and then the Erlang compiles into this. But if you were, say, trying to, for some terrible reason, were trying to make a JavaScript um, uh, compiler for the Beam, um, then, uh, you know, it would be different. You would probably target this language that, that um, this book describes. So just a tiny one, uh, two, two little bits about... Um, what the what the beam is and what processes are. Um, processes, the processes that you work with in your Elixir programs, um, they're really just little blocks of memory, only a few K usually to start off with. Um, and the emulator is basically swapping backwards and forwards between different processes that are ready to run. Um, and so if you looked at the memory, I mean these are just C structures in the end of the day, if you looked in the if the if you looked in the um, the beam, the C version of the emulator. Um, the process control block contains things like what the PID of the process is, the current instruction pointer, like where are we up to in the program, um, and other sorts of process state stuff that you would get if you used an Erlang process info call, which tells you things about the number of reductions and all these other sorts of number of all these other sorts of stats. So that's basically where the process is kept under control. Um, there's another big block of memory which is shared by the stack and the heap. The stack is basically the set of local variables for each function call. So every time you call a function, if there's any local variables, they all got, get stored in a little frame in the stack. And every time a function calls another function, um, it adds another frame of variables onto the stack building down in memory. And at the same time, all of those big chunky bits of you know, memory that you have, which are um, uh, your binaries and your, and your strings and your lists and all of those other things, they're all getting piled up in the heap. Um, and whenever the stack and the heap run into each other, it is garbage collection time. But importantly, and this is one of the great performance advantages of the, the whole beam, is that when you garbage collect, you're only garbage collecting for one process. All of those other lovely isolated processes out there aren't going to get affected by your garbage collection when your stack runs into your heap. Um, and the mailbox just, this is all I've put references into the beam book um, sections that talk about this. There's a lot more detail. I'm hiding a lot of information. The mailbox is where all your inbound variables, uh, inbound messages are. Um, 
they have to be able to buffer up somewhere. And then when the process runs, they can get copied into the heap so that you're able to um, refer to them with variables and your code. You know, when you do a receive, the, the message has to have come from the mailbox onto the heap for you to be able to work with it. Um, I have to just be, this is the, I'm only covering the minimum amount of stuff to make the next um, page of code readable for you. Um, so I just want to talk about variables um, on the virtual machine. Um, variables in the higher level languages are really just syntactic sugar for registers, um, which are the variables, the things that the, you know, are the function arguments, the things we pass to plus and minus and all this sort of stuff, um, we use registers. Um, and we only get to refer to these things when we're writing assembly code. Um, they, um, so there's basically X and Y registers, X zero um, is often used as the, is the return value. It's the first argument to your function. Um, it's because it's almost used almost every single instruction um, uses X zero, you know, it's super common. So it's usually stored in a real register in the real physical um, CPU that's running, um, that's running the emulator. Um, X1 to 1000, uh, they're all global, they're, they're global to this process. So they're basically, um, they, um, they're variables that um, you could, yeah, you can, you can have a variable X1, X2, X3, up to X1000. Um, and you can, refer, you can refer to them from anywhere in the process. They're not limited to this function. And then you have Y registers and Y registers refer to things on the stack. And so that means that if you're going to make a function call um, and you've got a local variable before and after that function call that you want to keep, then that'll need to be a Y. Um, that'll need to be a, you know, a Y register so that, it, so that when you come back from your function call, it's still there in the stack frame. Um, and just to talk about, like, if you're imagining what's inside the stack, or, or, um, the, it's only very immediate Erlang terms like PIDs and ports and very small integers that can actually fit in the stack. Everything else is sort of like a pointer or a reference to something in the heap. Okay, they call them boxed terms. So all of your big bulky variable contents are sitting there in the heap, but they're sort of pointers pointing to it from the what from Y registers in the stack. Um, and okay, I will move on because that's um. Hopefully it'll make, I think the only thing I could do now is actually show you some code that would make more sense of that. So keeping with that one, two, three, four, five, those different clauses, um, uh, I'm going to take it clause by clause and show you the assembler code that corresponds to that, that clause. Um, we're looking at the code that was generated from the LFE uh, code. Um, and that's for two reasons. The first reason is that I said that the Bean book wasn't finished yet. And one of the areas that is not finished is um, the explanation of all of the binary manipulation instructions. So they're really under-documented. And so if I was to show you the Elixir code um, at this level, I wouldn't be able to explain what most of the instructions were doing. I could tell you that they were to something to do with manipulating a binary. But because, um, because LFE is just working with character lists like Erlang does, um, this code is going to be a lot easier to understand. Um, the second thing is that that list prefix syntax looks a lot more, actually looks a lot more like this code. And so it, I'm hoping it would be easy for, easier for you to correlate, even though you've only just learnt LFE or are still wondering what the hell, you know, what, what, was, what was all that stuff a few slides back. Um, I, I think it, it is sort of, it's sort of helpful, particularly because we don't have good documentation for the binary stuff yet. Um, okay, so there's the LFE code fragment up at the top. Um, the first shameful secret for all us um, functional programmers. Oh, well, no, actually two things first. Um, here's a function. Um, th this is the, you know, the top level function, the, the, public, the public interface that people call when they want to get an ISBN checked. That number is the arity. And that number is, the, is, um, is a, a, a go-to effectively. It's saying this function starts at label two. And this is the shameful secret um, um, is that at the end of the day, underneath all of our beautiful um, functional programming, there are actually go-tos um, in the um, in down in down in this code. So um, yeah, all of those labels there, um, like this one here, um, these are actually go-to targets, 
and you'll see a whole load of F number references through the code. And those are basically jump instructions saying you should jump to label. F4 means jump to label four. And two there means go to label two. Um, what happens, and this is the same in the Elixir code, um, is that every function starts with a label with a label in there, which is basically just has the instructions for where to go to if that function blows up. Um, and so what happens is this is, when you get um, an exception thrown, um, it's actually that line and that func info, um, those two lines are what tells you what line of the source code um, caused the error. And also some information about what module and what function was running at the time that the error occurred. Okay, so that's, um, that's what those two lines and the label one and the those two lines, and you'll see that in all the functions. That's basically the error handling block. Um, so is there anything else I want to say there? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so here, um, when this function was called, the ISBN list, that will be in X0. Remember I said we talked about registers, so the X0 always has the first argument in it. Um, we need to call us, we're gonna call ourselves with the contents of X0 um, and, um, and these two numbers. So X, so we're going to, we're, we, this is just basically we're going to load some values into some registers, then we're going to call a function. And so we take the number zero, that literal, and we're going to move it into register X2. We take the number 10, we move it into register X1, and the ISBN list is already in X0. So now we can call the function at four, at, um, at four. so, I'll show you there. Yeah, so that basically is, um, yeah, we're gonna call, we're gonna jump to label four and we've got three arguments, including the one, the character list in, in X0. And it's and the reason it's called call only, there are various different versions there. Call only means it's tail recursive. You can see that this is the last instruction in this function. So we don't need, if we kept, had put anything on the stack at this point, we don't need to keep it because there are no more instructions in this function for, that are going to be able to reference variables. So when you do tail recursion, it means we can use the same stack frame. We don't have to make another copy or you know preserve whatever's on the stack here. We can actually go and write over whatever's in the stack because this function's essentially dead. And when I don't know if people have grappled with the concept of what tail recursive means, um, maybe this helps um, helps make it clearer. You don't need to keep because here there's a, there, there are bad consequences to filling up the stack. If you keep blowing up the stack when you don't need to, you'll eventually need to garbage collect because you'll run out of you'll run out of space. Um, so yeah, so tail recursion is a nice optimization uh, to um, just basically reuse the current stack frame. Doesn't actually apply here because there's no Y registers being used. But if there were Y registers being used, so using call only means hey, you could write over any Y register values that we've already got. Um, next bit, next chunk. I've put the, um, this is the complicated one. Um, I've put the, um, there's the uh, LFE version of the code up the top again. This is the one which does the calculation. Sorry, Robin, can, <clears throat> can I ask a quick question? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> well, I'm sure you have explained, but uh, do you mind uh, just uh, quickly explain again, uh, what does the X0, uh, X1 means? They are registers, are they on the heap or on the stack? Um, the X's, um, the X's are actually stored in an array in the, in the, there'll be a C array. I'll go back to just, don't worry, I'll, I'll jump back to here. <clears throat> um, all the X's are kept, uh, so X0 is apparent, is, um, X0 is stored, spent, is always stored in a physical machine register because it's accessed so often. All the other X's, there's just a big C array in your beam emulator, which are keeping track of those. So they're just basically for every, for every process, you have, you have like a thousand, you have a thousand X, there's another thousand X registers that you could, you could refer to. And they're global to that, they're global to that, um, to that process. And the Y registers are the only ones that appear on the stack. I think there is an example of a Y register coming up in the code, but they're a bit rarer. Um, they're a bit rarer because this is, there's so little happening because these are all just like one line clauses. There's almost there's almost never um, there's almost never any local variables that you want to keep in your current stack frame in this example. 
because you know we're always just doing we're always just immediately calling something else so we don't have a chance to really build up any local variables yeah um it's there's also, I'll just say, there's a description in um, in the Beam book. It's a great, th look, there's some fragments of really great writing in there. Um, it's, it's, it's it's a mixed bag, but um, that's, no, sorry, that's a faint praise. I mean, what that, what I wanted to say is there's some actually great stuff in there. And one of the bits is they talk about the difference between register virtual machines and stack-based virtual machines. And they go through some examples and they say that there are these two styles of virtual machines. This is a register-based machine. And um, so... Um, yeah, really, the stack is just being used. All that's going on the stack are Y register values um, when we when we have them. Does does that help? Yeah, it helps a lot. Thanks. Oh, this makes okay. a lot more sense. Thanks. Okay, hang on. I'll just go through my build. 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 Here we are. Okay. So um, I've got some I've got some pop up comments on this, so this will make a bit more sense. Although the first one is. Um, here's an example of something I can't find any documentation for in the um, in the um, Beam book. Although I suspect, um, you know, we've talked about Dialyxer in other presentations in the past, and so Dial Dialyzer, Dialyx, sorry, Dialyzer, I can never remember because there's like three different, you know, depends which one. But Dialyzer is able to do type inference on on um, libraries that you do not have source code for. And so my suspicion is that these lines here, that the ones ending, starting with the percentage mark, is basically this is basically extra type information about the arguments in X, in, the, in these two registers um, that um, that is used that could be used if dialyzer. If we compile this into a beam, um, and we had some other thing that was depending on this ISBN verifier, and we we're trying to do dial, dial, dialyzer type checking type inference. Then I think these are the lines that actually help dialyzer work some things out. That's my best theory. Um, these ones here, okay. So this is basically our. Um, these are our guard clauses, okay. Um, so first of all, we're checking to see one of the clauses further down the list. It's basically saying further down then one of the one of the clauses further down the list is testing for an empty list as the first argument um and what that and that and that piece of code is actually down at label eight and so what it's actually saying here is um in in all if, we, if you're looking at all our function heads um if you have if you've just passed an empty list as the first argument you should jump straight down to down to um on our um clause number five which is at label eight because um, because none of these none of these patterns are going to match before then, okay. And that's when people talk about um, you know when when you get release notes for Erlang or something, and people talk about you know optimizations they've made in the compiler. This the sort of logic that works this out and says, hey, you could jump straight down to that one and not have to look at all these other tests. Um, that's the sort of thing that they talk about when they talk about compiler optimizations. Um, so then the next thing is um, we're going to get list just basically breaks the um, breaks the list in um, in in register zero x zero into a head in x three and a rest of a list in x zero. So it's basically just chopped off, and and that's another optimization. Sorry, I'll try to go faster, but it's I've just noticed that um, we eventually we're going to have to call again passing the list as the first argument. And the compiler has worked out that hey, we can just put this, put the rest of this back into x zero because the next time we make a function call, it'll be in the right place and we won't have to move it again. Um, um, and then here we're just doing. Um, notice that the head of the list was the character that we want to do our guard expression on is currently in x three. So now there's two tests. Um, notice they use greater than and they swap the orders of the arguments. Um, they're basically just comparing. To, they're just checking to see that the C, the ASCII value of our of our character, is between zero and is between the digit zero and the digit nine. Okay, so that's the guard expression. Um, it's also interesting. I think I've put this note somewhere else, but note that even though guards are a big separate feature of Elixir and Erlang and LFE, down at this level, they're just logic tests. So you know, down at down at down at this level, there's nothing special about a guard. It's just a test with a, with a go to with a with a jump if we um if the test comes out one way or the other. 
where we're going, we're going to go to label five um, if they're greater than. So that's basically that's basically jump to after this function clause. Um, the rest of this is where we do all of our maths. So the first thing is GC biff. You see a lot of GC biff in this code. GC biff means garbage collected built in function. Um, and the reason that's a garbage collected built in function is sometimes when you're halfway through doing the function, you will run out of your stack will collide with your heap and you will need to know what stuff you need to save when you do your garbage collection. And so that's what the number four is the, in that first GC biff for the minus. It's, um, it's basically saying, first of all, F0 is branched to F0 is like an, the old, for LFE, F0 is the something has gone terribly wrong error handling label, which I haven't shown in the listing. The number four is this is how many registers we're using at the moment. So if you're going to do garbage collection, and, that, and the reason they do that is if you're going to do garbage collection, save the four registers. Don't throw out four registers. So you have to keep account of how many registers you're using in your code at this point so that the garbage collector doesn't decide to throw out an X register that you're using. And then the, in the list, um, the, there are your two arguments, X register one and an integer literal one, because we're subtra subtracting one from our coefficient and we're putting the result in X4. Um, and then these, and then I don't have to explain in, in as much detail, except to point out that the number of registers they're using has gone up to five in the next line. Um, they're doing the subtraction from ASCII 48, which is a zero character. They're doing the multiplication on the next line. They're doing the sum. And if you trace through and watch out which registers the results are going into, it all makes sense. It's basically taking the result of that one and the result of that one, and then adding them together on, the, on that line. And finally, um, X4, um, that's the result of um, N minus one. Um, we need to move it into the right position. Um, but because of all the clever compiler optimizations that have been done to this point, we only had to move one thing to be prepared to do our call. X0 is already in the right spot. The other ones were in the right spot, but they had to do one little swap to get ready to make the call to ourselves again. And we're going to go back. Notice where, again, we're doing a tail recursive call with three arguments, and we're going back to label four, which is the top of this block of code that we're looking at. So we're going to kind of keep re-entering this block of code which makes sense if you think about the clauses that we're, that we're um, dealing with up above. Um, and by the way, there's this big, you see how they've actually got the string for minus sign and a string, a string for multiplication and plus. There's a big table that the, the Beam book talks about. There's a table that's generated with the, um, with the Beam emulator that, that maps all of those operators to C functions inside the emulator. So it's almost like this is like an incredibly fast um, shell or console where you can type, you can type all of these commands in, um, and then there's a little, there's a C function which will implement it, and you just have to remember that this is all like an order of magnitude again faster than what than the, than our code runs. The closer we get down to C and the closer we get down to real assembler, the faster and you know we keep on getting order of magnitude speed improvements. But this is basically like sitting at a shell typing commands one after another. Um, and um, but it's just very very fast. Um, I just want one thing I say. I know that this is like it's all a big brain dump. But when I started, I was super super lucky to start programming when I was really young on six five zero two assembler, which was in an Apple II. And the lovely thing about this is the reason I I'm not as worried about this is this is actually quite like modern Intel processors have got huge instruction sets and they're very daunting to sort of get into. But the nice thing about the virtual machine is it is actually sort of approachable. I mean, it sort of reminds me of the early days of assembly programming when it was just 8-bit and it was all a bit simpler and more approachable. And, you know, a primary school kid could actually do a little bit of assembler. So it's, um, so yeah, it's, um, it's, it, it all makes sense. And we're covering a lot of it as we go through this. I think there's only one or two more screens here. Um, so this one, um, I'll just point out that here's, um, here's actually a case. Select val is like a way of doing a case where based on the value in, um, in X3, um, we can jump to uh, different spots. I think F9, I think is the default clause. So if none of these match, go to label nine. Um, if, um, if the character matches um, integer 45, which is a minus sign, go to F7. If it matches integer 88, which is a capital X, go to F6. Is basically what happens. Um, 
And just keep in mind that like there's this constant backwards and forwards between the people writing the beam and the compiler writers. What happens is they'll compile something, they'll see that it's produced something that's inefficient, and then the compiler writer will say to the beam people, say, if you had an instruction that did this, we could give you a hint that this is actually what the programmer wants to do. And they say, okay, we'll change the beam instruction set and we'll and we'll um and we'll change what the compiler produces. And that's where all these little varieties, if you go through the Beam book, all the little varieties of slightly different versions of the same function, they exist because there's some exploit that they've worked out when they were trying to performance tweak the way the compiler works and the Beam works. They said, hey, if we can give you this hint, it allows you to um, be more efficient and make, and make this faster. So that's the sort of thing that's going on when you see all these little variations in instructions. Um, Okay, um, here's just some more guard. Uh, well, if the list is if the list is empty, go jump down to label nine again, which we saw earlier was the first was one of the clauses that starts with an empty list. Um, also, jump down there if um, if the next argument isn't one. Okay, because we're looking at that last. We're looking at the check digit being in the last position, so we want to. Um, we're basically. I noticed the time. It's almost nine o'clock, so we're almost there. Um, uh, yeah, we're basically just doing some little pattern matching there, which looks very much like a guard. It looks exactly the same sort of commands as a guard. Um, and then down here, we just do a little bit more adding. Um, we shuffle some and we shuffle some arguments around, and we call label four again, the top of our, the top of all of our expressions. Um, oh, and this one, I think label seven. That one is there. You go. That's some. Um, Label seven is just um, that was where we went if there was a minus sign, and all we're doing is we go back and call ourselves again, but this time x zero has had the first character chopped off, and so it's doing exactly what the um, what the uh, minus eating up the minus sign code does. Uh, last page. Um, okay, um, here we are. We're finally, these are actually just like. Two, two versions of coming to the um, the empty well the, the empty list um, thing um, if we have got an empty list go straight to label nine um, if we've got zero in the second argument um, go to label nine um, and then we basically do our call to remainder and there's another one of those string you know rem in quotes saying, if you go and look up this table in the C code that was generated, there'll be a C function that does remainder for you with those arguments. And then there's another built-in function which does your equals equals. And finally, that's the equivalent of just saying, um, if we've managed to drop through to label nine, then just return false because um, this is not a valid ISBN number. Ah, okay. Now, one last thing I'll say is that um, that if you look in the Erlang compiler, um, if you look in the Erlang compiler um, API, there is actually um, there are actually some things there where you can pass it a list of forms. That is, you can basically pass it. If you remember, we, if you actually pass a list a list of Erlang Erlang tuples in this format, it looks like you can actually get the compiler to compile it straight into Beam for you. And so, if you're writing, so an interesting follow up to this presentation might be to see if we can write a macro or some or some elixir code that actually just takes some simple does some simple code generation and actually just generates a list of tuples that describe something like this you should be able to pass it down to Erlang compile form or something like that and then actually call the function which would be quite cool I don't know why but it just seems like it's there and we should do it um, that's me um, those are the links to exorcism and um, LFE and the beam book and um, thanks very much.